afternoon, everybody. If I can ask you to have a seat, please. Bring your pizza and delicious drinks and uh, take a seat. I'd like to welcome you to the second session of Positive Links here at the University of Michigan, hosted by the Center for Positive Organizational Scholarship. Uh, in the first session of this series on positive business, we heard from Anjan Thakke uh, on the economics of higher purpose. And so we're continuing into the second of these sessions on marketing. Uh, and these, this series, the Positive Links series, is made possible uh, by the generous support of Paul and Diane Jones sitting at the front here. So thank you for your support. And today we're going to have the privilege of, of hearing a talk and interacting with Professor Rick Bogosi from the Ross School of Business. Uh, professor Bogosi is a professor of behavioral science and management here in the marketing department. And we're uh, thrilled that you can join us today uh, and add another dimension to our study of, of positive business. So without further ado, I will turn it over and thank you, Rick Bogosi. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I didn't expect so many people, so uh, thank you for coming. I plan to do two things. I want to look first at, um, from the um, firm's point of view and the salesperson or account manager's point of view, and talk about some of the research we've been doing about looking inside the brains of managers. So I'll give some background on that in just a few minutes. And then uh, if there's time at the end, I want to turn to the consumer, the customer, and how they respond uh, to corporate responsibility or irresponsibility. So let me start with um, um, the, the first study, which is going to look at empathy primarily. Now, I want to draw a contrast. There, there's a lot of emerging work going on now, not only in the hard sciences, but in organization behavior and marketing, um, looking at neuroscience, looking at genetics, hormones, um, but I want to uh, draw attention there or contrast because we have to think about um, what is it in the environment in, inside the actual consumer or the actual manager um, that interacts with this science side of things inside the brain. Um, so there's a natural kind of tendency there. I want to give a, some real brief background on, on the research that's been done in the brain. A lot of it has happened for, for ages. About 6,000 years ago, um, there were remains found in, in the Ural Mountains with instruments that um, um, doctors used to relieve uh, tension in the, with brain injuries. 6,000 years ago, it's, it's really amazing. And 4,500 years ago, the Egyptians were doing the same thing. And then I came across recently, 2,500 years ago in Peru, the doctors there were using very similar instruments that when there was a trauma to the brain, it would relieve the, the pressure there. They knew enough about it. So by looking at things that happened from the outside or from the inside, we've made a lot of inferences of what really is going on inside the brain. And um, the first one I want to talk about just real briefly is um, a study done by a French doctor, uh, uh, Broca. Um, he had a patient who had difficulty enunciating and speaking. This is in the 1830s in France. And after the patient died, they actually um, looked at his brain, and here's a picture of it. That's, um, they call it Broca's brain, but it's really his, his patient's brain. And this is a left hand, this is the left side of the brain, and you can see there's a hole there. Now, I'm, I'm red, green, colorblind, so I have a hard time I can't see it. <laughs> you see the hole that's about here? Um, that's now called Broca's area. And it's connected with our um, lips, tongue, and enunciation of words. Um, there's another area that's about here called Wernicke's area that's also connected with speech and, and language. So this is how there's this uh, trauma or lesion or tumor uh, a hole in his brain, and uh, they made connections back in the 1830s then with this function, our speech. Um, the next one also occurred in the 1930s, and was uh, 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 this is a picture of Phineas, Phineas Gage, who was um, a foreman on a railroad in New Hampshire, 1830s. 
And one of the things they did, which was a lot of rock there, they had to remove. So they used dynamite, you know, the early versions of dynamite. They would drill a hole a few feet into the ground, about this much in diameter. And then he would take this metal bar that he's holding in his arms and pack it down. And being a foreman, it was his job to make sure everything was done right. And when he was looking down at one of the holes, the dynamite went off and this iron bar shot through his, the bottom of his jaw, up through his skull. You can see his left eye is uh, not functioning. And here's a recreation of what happened to him. So this is an industrial accident. He never lost consciousness because that bar shot right through his head. Never lost consciousness. Um, you know, obviously was in shock. Um, and they studied him for, the doctors, the MDs studied him for a number of years. And they found that his personality changed completely. Um, he was regarded as a very astute uh, manager, um, kind with his family, um, had a good personality and so on. But his personality changed completely over the next few months as he healed. Um, he couldn't control his behavior. He wasn't able to plan. He was getting into fights and uh, it became so unruly they, they got rid of him. And then he started to work for a circus and that this picture was taken when he was working for the circus, you know, taking advantage of his illness. Um, he didn't get along with people, but he could get along with animals. So he started um, watching horses. He went to South America and then eventually went up to San Francisco, always getting in fights, having difficulties. Um, and then he died in the San Francisco area a few years later, about 12 years later. Um, from this accident and other accidents like that, we learned uh, where's, where does planning, where, does our, where do our cognitive functions occur in the brain, um, our personality. In his case, it was the, um, near the medial prefrontal cortex in the front of the brain, right where that bar had gone through. You know, prior to this, people thought that our, uh, many of our functions were all diffused throughout the brain. But now we're starting to get a picture of that it's localized in, in different areas. Okay. So either by illnesses inside the brain or things that happen like accidents from outside, we slowly have been learning much um, about our behavior. And now we can use these functional magnetic resonance imagery machines. And that's what um, I and my colleagues have been using to see how managers um, function. Just a couple more background slides before I get to the study. Um, I put this in. These are cross sections and we're looking at the right hand side of the brain. And this is kind of a summary of the research where people have studied one emotion, envy, and found that there are multiple regions of the brain that are interconnected that in a sense govern empathy or envy. Um, and similarly with other emotions and other information processing. So it's, it's not just one region, but it's often multiple regions and they're coordinated in some way. Uh, this is a picture of, of, uh, created from the study that we did with managers. I just want to show what, how it's sometimes represented. This is the left-hand side of the brain and the colored part, uh, especially um, about in this region here, is looking at the, the skull in the upper right hand, is called the precuneus region. And I'm going to talk about that region in a few minutes. It's one of a number of regions that are connected with empathy. And in this case, it's, it has to do with helping us um, manage our distress when we see somebody else suffering. And the, um, another areas of the brain that have been discovered, I'll, I'll give a little background on in a few minutes, called mirror neurons. Um, you can see here, this is again the, the left-hand side of the brain, and it's, you, you can see where the tongue is and the lips and jaw. That was Broca's area. And if you follow that all the way up, we can see for the wrists, the elbows, the thigh, these are all the motor cortex and the premotor cortex. Each of those regions are connected to those physical movements for us, left and right hand side. Okay. And it, it turns out that that Broca's area, uh, it's, it's called the pars opercularis, uh, is connected with empathy. Okay, now I wanna give an example of empathy. Somebody was going to help me with this. Um, this is a um, YouTube video from a, a television news program in Chile uh, that shows a dog 
and the dog gets injured on the freeway, there's a camera right in the middle of the freeway, and so we're looking at the cars coming to us and the cars going away from us. We're right in the middle. And this dog gets injured, and there's something really remarkable that happens. This is truly amazing. Here's a dog that's been hit by a car trying to cross the road. Here he is trying to cross the road, and he gets hit. And he's now just lying in the middle of this busy highway, and a second dog spots him and tries to go over to him. Here's the first dog again being hit. He's lying there in the middle of the road, busy time up the highway, and here comes the second dog who grabs him, not by his teeth, but actually gets him with his paws around his neck and drags him in the middle of all this traffic off the road to save little by little, inch by inch. Finally, some workers spot the dogs and come over and help them. And by the way, the injured dog lived. Not sure how to turn it off. <laughs> well, um, it, it would be controversial to call this empathy. So that's controlled by a piece right here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, you know dogs have been bred for uh, thousands of years to, to please their masters, and I don't know whether we could say that dog was necessarily empathizing with the other dog, but that kind of behavior we would characteristic. We call empathetic behavior. I'm going to be focusing on human empathy, and the, that's a positive thing that really is stimulated when we look at other people, in this case a baby, but if, it, if we see other people suffering or, or in very happy, joyful moods, there's something that happens within us, and that's what I want to talk about. Because the empathetic response is um, not a simple one, it's a real complex one. Now, um, this is um, a quote that's used to, to talk about how empathy in some way is embodied in us, not only internally to us, but through our body. So Greeley really says brains are encased in, affected by, and dependent on the rest of the body, but our most important interactions are with other people's brains as manifested through their bodies. There's some kind of interaction that goes on in our minds with the, what's going on in the minds of others that are not so obvious. Um, it's almost as if there's an electrical connection between us. Of course, it doesn't occur this way. It occurs through our senses, through our eyes and even our ears and, and other senses. And it gets processed through what's called the sensory thalamus, among, among other areas. Okay, what is empathy? Um, Eisenberg is a psychologist and has defined empathy as a, a compound mental state. It's not just a single emotion, but it it's in, involves many affective and, and uh, thinking-based states, and it's involved when we um, comprehend another person's emotional state, suffering or positive. And with three parts to empathy, um, there's a cognitive capacity to take the perspective of the other. You know, so it's a very thinking, rational almost part. Um, figure of speech, we sometimes say we put ourselves in the shoes of another person. So taking the perspective of another is another is an important part of empathy, but it's not the whole part. An emotional reaction to the feelings of others. Um, sometimes it's claimed that in empathetic uh, reactions that we actually feel the emotions that another person is feeling. It occurs more for suffering than it does for positive emotions. Um, other people talk about feeling compassion and pity or sympathy for another person. So this, this feeling of compassion is an affective state, an emotional state. The, the first one, this cognitive, top-down, um, uh, taking the perspective of another is something called an executive function. And then the emotional is called a bottom-up response because it's automatic, it's more automatic. And those are the, classically the two parts of empathy that are, have gone through the psychology literature for a number of decades. There's a third component that sometimes people um, look at. It's called the, um, a monitoring mechanism that registers the source of experienced affect, experienced emotion, 
in ways that differentiate ourselves from other people. Um, you can imagine if we see someone uh, suffer uh, terribly that we could get so upset that it's more about our reaction is more about ourselves than it is about the victim. And there has to be a differentiation there. And if we get too uh, or overly involved in it and don't differentiate ourselves from what is happening, um, get overwhelmed by it, um, then we're not uh, experiencing empathy. It's about us and not about them. So there's a monitoring mechanism that goes on, and it actually goes on in that precuneus region that I mentioned before, and that region that uh, Phineas Gage was injured in when that uh, dynamite blew up, the medial prefrontal cortex. Now, both of those are um, intimately involved in this differentiating self from others. Sometimes psychologists say it's a, a management of distress, that you can't feel too much distress and have an empathetic reaction. So there's some kind of balance that goes on there. Okay. Now, how was all this discovered? Well, um, in the 1990s, in a laboratory in, in Parma, Italy, um, a research neuroscientist called Rizzo Lati was doing studies um, with macaque monkeys. Um, they, they, were try, they tried to work with rhesus monkeys, but the rhesus monkeys are hard to handle and they were always biting the researchers. So they went to a more docile um, uh, monkey. They put electrodes in the brain of the monkey, which is um, difficult to do for us. Um, it's been done sometimes with epilepsy, but it's, um, it's usually not ethical and it's very difficult to do. But they were able to do this with the macaque monkeys. They placed those electrodes in the what in, in us is called the premotor cortex. It has a different name for monkeys. So they had electrodes right at the neural, neuron level so that they could monitor the firing of those neurons in that part of the brain. And that those things were hooked up to speakers so that every time it fired in the monkey's brain, you could hear it. And the, one of the researchers for um, Rizzolati Galese, um, the, the monkey was actually sitting on a table and he, Galese, was working on, I heard this story in different ways, it's a apocryphal story, but he was working on some equipment and he heard the speakers go off. And he realized that, you know, there's something's going on in the monkey and he turned around looking at the monkey who was looking at him. The monkey was just sitting there passively watching him. But every time he moved, that part of the brain that had that electrode was firing. And this was the discovery of mirror neurons, like a mirror so that we see, well, when we see another person move, even if we're standing still and not moving, um, that part of our brain is firing that's connected with that movement. And it's the same thing if we're just moving ourselves, the exact same part of the brain. So hence this mirror neurons. It's stronger when we're imitating someone, but it's still firing. So here's a kind of summary of it here. You know that if the monkey is moving his arm, then there's this region of the brain that's connected with the arm that's firing, but the same region is activated when the monkey is watching someone else move their arm. And it's not just through vision, it's also um, with the other senses. For example, when they, they tried some experiments with the um, peanuts, where they were breaking the shell and the monkey would just hear that sound, but that was enough to activate the part of the brain in the monkey. Mirror neurons is really, um, it's, it's still controversial in terms of where it occurs in the parts of the brain and how it functions completely, but it really was a, a revolution and allowed us to look at things like empathy. And here, this is a summary of some of those parts of the brain. The, the most important for my purposes are where it says the in, inferior uh, frontal gyrus. This was the Broca's area or the pars opercularis. That's one of the key areas that we're finding with managers. And then there's another area that's about here, uh, temporal parietal junction, which is another important area. And then there are a couple others as well, but these are the most important for our research at this time. Now, in terms of um, empathy, here's a, a news a person in Newsweek talking about Steve Jobs. He says, Apple Jobs is a relentless perfectionist whose company creates such beautifully designed products that they have changed our expectation about how everything around us should work. He has an uncanny ability to cook up gadgets that we can't uh, live without. 
I wouldn't claim, after looking at his biography, that Steve Jobs was an empathetic person. <laughs> um, but somehow he made his organization empathetic and responding to the needs of customers better than the competition. Um, so that um, uh, we have influence on others to be empathetic, and that's, that's one of the managerial things that I'll try to touch on later. Okay, now, I had grown up as a doctoral student, and uh, um, Phil Kotler and Sidney Levy were on my dissertation committee, and they um, developed this concept, the marketing concept, in the late 1960s. That's a long time ago, and at that time, uh, professors were, were business people. So they didn't think about, they thought of marketing selling physical products and sometimes services, but they didn't think of marketing um, tools or tactics that could be used for, at museums or hospitals. Um, and they also coined the philosophy or, or the dogma that, that a company should start with the needs of customers. And if they can start with the customer's needs, identify those needs, and then build the product or service to meet those needs, um, the needs of customers will be better met, and so will the needs of the firm. Um, that, that was a, a big revelation at that time period, but it had its critics, and Luck came out with a, a rejoinder, or a, uh, actually a criticism, uh, where he said that that's taking things too far, that businesses should only be concerned with the stakeholders and, and profitability, and that we, um, you know, we shouldn't overemphasize um, the needs of the customer. Okay, now we, um, we're studying account managers here, and we're uh, going to look inside their brains, but at the same time we had to measure their orientation towards customers or towards the, the old viewpoint of, of um, the stakeholder, the firm only. So we use this scale to measure people's reactions, and the sales orientation scale uh, I, this is uh, figuratively speaking, it asks the question, you know, how can I convince the customer to buy our product? Uh, how can I convince the customer to buy our product, even if they might not even need the product? Uh, we have something that we make, you know, let's, how can we push this onto the market? This is sort of the, the, the orientation. So we're, we're creating two opposites here, and as a matter of tendency, and so most people maybe are leaning towards one or the other. The, the customer orientation is, figuratively speaking, is what's in the best interest of the customer. That's the starting point. How can I or the firm adjust um, the message, the product, to best, best meet those needs? So we measured those, and I'm just going to give you some example items from the scale. Here's from the customer orientation scale. It gives you a flavor of the philosophy. And I try to get customers to discuss their needs with me. I try to find out what kind of product would be most helpful to the customer. I try to bring a customer with a problem together with a product that helps them solve the problem. I try to give customers an accurate expectation of what the product will do for them. I try to figure out what a customer's needs are. So that, that's the orientation. All of the people in our study um, responded to those kinds of items. And then they also responded to these kinds of items, the sales orientation. And you can see a little bit of... Um, maybe Machiavellianism in this, but I don't want to push that too far. I try to sell a customer all I can convince him to buy, even if I think it is more than a wise customer would buy. I try to sell as much as I can rather than a satisfied customer. If I'm not sure a product is right for a customer, I'll apply pressure to get him to buy it. I paint too rosy a picture of my products to make them sound as good as possible. It is necessary to stretch the truth in describing a product uh, to a customer. This is an existing scale, this is customer orientation sales scale by its, uh, Sachs and Whites, and we used it to um, measure the self-image that the salespeople had, and then we tried to associate that with, with what goes on in the brain under the experimental conditions that we were looking at, that I'm going to describe here. The, we wanted to, in the first study, we wanted to focus on the emotional side of empathy. So we didn't want to get too much into putting yourself in the shoes of others, consciously putting yourself in the shoes of others. That's the second study I'll get to. Um, so we developed faces of um, men and women, young and old, at, who in the videos posed um, the, the happy faces, so the video showed their face. 
where it started out neutral and they were happy and smiling. Um, uh, disgust was another uh, emotion that we looked at. Anger, surprise. And then we had neutral faces and then a, as one control condition. And in other conditions, we had moving geometric forms. So there was no anthropomorphic, strong anthropomorphic content to those. They're just triangles and circles moving around. Uh, everybody saw those in a particular design, all those faces many times over, and while they were in the functionally magnetic resonance imagery machine. So we had mirrors that uh, took these video images that, so they could see them while they were in the machine. And so while we're watching these faces um, in some randomized kind of order, um, the machine is scanning their brain, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of time, uh, approximately 12 or 15 minute uh, period. Uh, to use functional magnetic resonance imagery, it's not like the electrodes with the monkey. It's really a larger region. We're not as uh, able to pinpoint things as finely as if we had an electrode implanted in the brain. So we're looking at small regions. And to look at those small regions, we have to give stimuli. And while people are watching things, they have to scan it many times. And then that, that data are processed. Um, I'm going to show you an example of, of some of the stimuli just to give you a flavor for it. This will just take a minute. It's, uh, they were Dutch subjects. We were at Erasmus University Hospital. It should be coming, or maybe I have to do it. Yes. Experiment will begin in a second. It's supposed to be a neutral face. Another neutral. I guess that's discussed. <laughs> Everybody's personality is different. Neutral are, you know, um, objects that they would see. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them because there's 12 or 15 minutes of this, but uh, there are older people, younger people, men and women. Most of them are younger in the beginning here. But. So this is happy. Okay. So that's the idea. Everything, every time they saw a face, it starts off neutral and it turns to one of the conditions. And then um, they're shown on some sh schedule with um, one second in between for three seconds. And so this is an example um, uh, with the neutral faces. And I, I put this in in case I couldn't get the, the video to work, but <laughs> just so I could talk about it as a precaution. Now, this is a um, summary of the areas of the brain that we detected. So we're looking at uh, people's responses to these emotional slides in comparison to the control slides. So that's our comparison. They also, um, we also measured, they responded to a questionnaire where we measured their customer orientation. That's what I'm gonna focus on here. Degree of customer orientation from very low to very high. And the colored parts here, the things that were activated, these are, you can see number four there um, in the top diagram at the bottom left of the left-hand side of the brain there. That's the pars opercularis, that's a, near the Broca's area. Um, to the very far right there, number nine, it probably is hard to read, it says the fusiform gyrus. Um, that's a part of our brain that registers face processing. When we see another person's face, that part of the brain will be activated. So in a sense, that's like a manipulation check. That shows us that indeed, uh, people are looking at these faces and the brain is working and being uh, activated. Um, so that's the surface of the brain there with different areas. And then the bottom shows a cross section, so more interior to the brain. And those things as well are related to the um, mirror neuron system. Now, the way we summarize things, in, um, I'm not going to go through the data here. I just want to make the point that there were nine regions of the brain for these, and these were all sales managers, sales account managers. 
um, that volunteered, about 25 of them approximately, one at a time, of course, in the machine. Um, they were very um, curious and flattered, and we gave them $15 in the, in the gift, but, um, and, and a picture of their brain. Um, <laughs> but they, they were mostly curious and, and, and flattered by it. And, um, what I want to point out now is that there are these nine areas the first four are the mirror neuron system, and in the very right hand column is a, a number, it's a correlation coefficient. And this is how strongly the activation of the brain that's listed at the left correlates with their response on the questionnaire with regard to customer orientation. So there's a number that goes from minus one to plus one. So the, in this case, they're all positive. And they're, they're pretty high, actually. The 0.55 in the upper right says that the more um, customer orientated the um, sales manager was, the more activated the supplemental motor area of their brain was activated, which is one of the mirror neuron parts of the brain. And similarly for, for the other parts of the brain as well. The more customer orientated they were, the more activated all these different regions um, were for them. So we're able, to, with real managers, able to link their mental, you know, physiological responses in the brain to their psychological um, customer orientation. So that's the first step that we, we try to do in all our studies. Um, use real managers, but do a scientific study to activate their brain. The second part that we try to do in each of our um, research papers is just to go out into the field with a group of real managers, and that's what we did here, I think there were a hundred and some managers or so. And we wanted to link their score on customer orientation to see how do, what does customer orientation lead to in the field. And for these kinds of uh, account managers, um, the, there are three things that are important. We, it's sometimes called alliance building. The actions that they can take that build relationships with their customers. And the first one is um, summarized here is discerning capabilities and practices in the buying center social network. These account managers sell to corporations, but there are multiple people in the corporation that they sell to, uh, gatekeepers, uh, multiple decision makers. Um, it's sort of a social network, social capital in, in involved there. Um, so that, their ability to discern that network is one of the skills that we were trying to measure in the field. And then secondly, we looked at their ability to acquire knowledge from customers. Um, how for the, person, the decision maker, um, him or herself, um, how, how good were they to identify what those needs were and interact with those customers. And then the last um, thing that we looked at was a, a gaining knowledge of the entire context, which they, the sales account managers do um, by looking at trade publications, by going to uh, conferences, um, meetings, um, looking at economic data, financial data. Um, it's kind of a situational context analysis. So they, they get a, a, a sense, uh, part of their ability is to look at the whole situation, part of it is with the actual customer, and part of it is with the network of people that they have to deal with in the customer's firm. So we measured all of those things. We developed a questionnaire to measure those. And then we um, measured, the, in this case, both the customer orientation and sales orientation kind of measured, represented at the left. That's just summarizing their responses from the questionnaire that we developed and we tried to link those to these dependent variables on the right, which are how well they actually build alliances with customers in the three senses I just spoke about. And then we use the statistical technique to see, you know, what is that linkage like? And it turns out that sales orientation had no significant effect. The, the little NS means not significant. It, sales orientation had no effect on their contextual knowledge formation or motivation to learn from customers and their buying center knowledge formation. But their customer orientation, the stronger they had a customer orientation, the better they did in these capabilities on the right. Um, so the number 0 0.7565 and uh, 101 is a, with the stars on there means those are statistically significant effects. Customer orientation influences the ability in the field. So the first study looks inside their minds 
and shows that that's linked with how they feel about customer orientation. It's called a multi-level analysis. It takes neuroscience, links it with psychological responses. And then a second study, we take it in the field and we try to link those psychological responses to other kinds of capabilities with the, with the salespeople. All of this was just looking at the emotional part of empathy, um, their empathetic response in an affective sense. Now we want to look at it in the thinking sense, uh, which call, is called theory of mind. So we did another study. I'm going to come back to the implications later when I can uh, bring things all together. Um, a theory of mind is a um, term that's been used in psychology and philosophy and, and neuroscience um, to represent how uh, we all make inferences about other people's beliefs or decisions or feelings or intentions. It's something we do automatically. I mean, we, we learn over decades and we don't think a lot about it. But when we're watching someone else, actor and actress on TV or person we're interacting with, we're making these inferences all the time about what are they thinking or what might be they thinking. We might we're not perfect, we might make mistakes. What do they really intend to do? How do they feel about me or my product, for example? Um, this is called theory of mind. And it's based on a notion that uh, only humans, and, and after watching that dog, I, I think that maybe this is too stark a contrast. I, I think some animals seem to be able to um, almost sense the needs of others. I, 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 often sit in my living room in a special chair to read and I have, a, um, it's my children's dog, um, a bearded collie. And um, uh, he saw me as the master, uh, I guess, because uh, I took him out to do his business, like probably, and fed him. Um, I'm sitting in the chair reading and uh, he went up to my office, I didn't see this, he went up to my office, got a book, brought it downstairs and put it in my lap. It, it, it only happened once. And, and of course, I didn't ever train him. But somehow, you know, he wanted to, to meet my needs, I guess. And, and I don't know whether he was inferring my needs right then. But, you know, it, it's uh, hard to say. Um, but we certainly um, are capable of representing our intentions, other people's intentions, what, what you believe, what he believes, she believes. We can represent those and think about it. It's not clear that uh, animals can do that. Now, um, uh, autism, which is a developmental uh, brain disorder um, characterized by impaired communication and, and related um, symptoms, um, is related to this kind of communication. And I'm, I'm going to talk about it in a little depth here. The, this is uh, Thomas the, the tank, or Thomas the engine, you may have seen. Um, people that have autism, uh, and especially notice with children, um, have a, a difficult time um, interacting with people and, and understanding how they are reacting. And, the, and they especially have a difficult time inferring what the feelings of that person are. There are dozens of muscles in our face, and people have put transducers on the face, and they've found that they're connected to our feelings, positive feelings, negative feelings. Even when our face is completely impassive, those mu muscles are really firing, and you can measure whether a person is happy, sad, angry, likes me, dislikes me, and so on. A person with autism has difficulty registering and processing that information. Um, uh, so much so that they can be really anxious and um, so anxious that they can't interact with others. Um, somebody discovered that young children with autism, when they were watching Thomas the Tank, um, were able, some children, not all, were able to learn from it and feel comfortable about it and, and good about it. Um, and it was just therapeutic for them. Um, in Thomas the Tank, you know, he's happy in the upper left, angry in, in the upper right. Um, I would call this a surprise reaction, which most psychologists don't uh, consider an emotion. It's an orientation reflex, not an emotion. But there are just a small number of emotions 
that Thomas the Tank shows with a small number of cues in the face. So with anger, you know, the eyebrows down, the eyes closed, you know, the mouth may be shut. And just two or three cues are enough, but there are many more than that when we infer someone else's anger that we don't think about consciously usually. Um, so this works for autistic um, uh, children. I read everything I could find on autism. I started with Uta Frith's book. She's a British um, neuroscientist who's written um, a lot of things on, on autism. And I read everything I could find, and then um, out of that I discovered, well, we can do research. Autism isn't just you're autistic or not. It can be considered a, a matter of degree. If it's a developmental disorder, in some ways we're all a little bit autistic, and or an autistic, so-called autistic person is a little bit so-called normal. Um, so it's a matter of degree. And we thought, well, let's see if managers could be put on this spectrum. And we developed a scale to measure autism in managers um, and gave it to them. Now, it was that we're taking a big chance because um, the literature is mostly done with uh, children, um, and they compare autistic children who, ha who have it, um, the symptoms quite strongly to mentally retarded children and sell them to uh, the normal children. It's much easier for them to find a difference between someone who has strong autis autism and doesn't have that symptom. Here we're dealing with managers who are along a continuum, so we didn't know if it would work. Um, and so uh, we're taking a very optimistic uh, outlook on autism. Uh, autism. This is a uh, University of California Davis, which is a uh, is famous for its research with autistic children who believe that um, um, uh, behavior can be changed. Uh, most of the literature uh, claims that it can't. That if a person has autism. Uh, the causes of it will never change. They can compensate, they claim, but that the causes won't change. Quickly, we see there's a card game going on here, maybe, and, and the person on the right, the younger um, uh, man, uh, is looking down at his cards, maybe thinking about whether he should play or not. Notice he's got more money on the table, and the, the way he's dressed, we might infer you know, that he's wealthy. But more than that, there's some kind of relationship going on between the woman in the middle through her eye gestures and, and pointing with her hand. She's connected with the guy on the left who has a couple of cards in his belt. And so they're, they're obviously uh, working together maybe to cheat the boy or young man on, on the right to take his money. And the person pouring the wine who knows both people, knows what's going on, sort of has this knowing look on her face. So it was a story anyway. We, we can tell a story with this painting. I've done it really quickly. Um, this painting was shown to a woman about 26 years old who had Asperger's disease, high-functioning autism. Um, so she, he was, she was a very intelligent woman. And she looked at this painting and was asked to write down all the things that she could think about. You know, what's on your mind? Write them down. Um, she looked at the painting for over an hour and a half. And everything she wrote down had to do with um, physical things, colors, you know, where the people sat. But she said nothing about the story that I crudely talked about a minute ago. And then... She, had, she made no inferences about what's going on between the people. And when they told her, when the researchers told her what might be going on, something like maybe I did, um, she looked at them and said, you know, you people, researchers, you people are crazy. You, you read into things, things that aren't there. You know, you make up things. And so, you know, very intelligent person, but not able to make those kinds of inferences about what's going on. Okay. So, we call this interpersonal mentalizing. That's the activity of inferring another person's beliefs, desires, etc., mental states. It's associated with putting ourselves in, in the shoes of another person and mentally maybe simulating what that other person uh, believes, desires, and so on. Okay. So, this is, uh, in the literature, it's called mentalizing. But we call it interpersonal mentalizing because we want to look at the sales account manager and customer. 
So now, the research on autism, uh, which we got familiar with um, uh, through Uta Fritz's book at first, um, has identified these regions. The, the medial prefrontal cortex, which is about half or three-quarter inch right here in the brain, uh, the temporal poles, left and right-hand side, and the temporal parietal junction, left and right-hand side. There's a lot of research that says those regions are where this developmental, the lack of developmental has occurred. Um, after we did the study, this has been an evolutionary process, I came across an article that um, identified the precuneus region that I mentioned in the previous study. So those are the main regions that uh, have been identified with regard to autism. So we wanted to activate those regions with salespeople. And how do we do that? Well, we developed first a scale. Um, it had four factors. So there are multiple items on a scale measuring each of four factors. And let me just describe it, because what we did was we looked at the communication literature, we looked at the sales force management literature, and the um, autism literature, and generated many items, many measures. And then we went through some pre-testing and pruning process and came up with a 14-item scale uh, through this so-called psychometric um, measurement um, process. And the first thing, the first factor we call building rapport. The second we call detecting nonverbal cues. And then the third and fourth factor, uh, the third one is taking a bird's eye view which is sometimes in the um, emotion literature is talking about a sense of irony. When we can step back and look at not only other people's behavior, but our own behavior as if we're almost watching it and, uh, and with a sense of irony, then that's a kind of um, coping mechanism and skill that helps us uh, process and interact with other people effectively. And then the last factor, um, was, was we called uh, shaping the interaction or, or conversation between a, manage, a sales account manager and a customer. So we, measured, we developed the scale and measured all that. We called it the sales theory of mind scale, the stone scale. And so all our subjects, or all our, we use, again, real account managers, all of them filled out the scale. And then we put them in fMRI machines and put them under experimental conditions. And the way we did that is we found, um, uh, we, we put them in, we had them uh, uh, listen to stories. This was all very new to us. None of us had any background in neuroscience or anything like this. And at first we had the, them read, but when they were reading things, their, their head was moving too much. So we had to, then we used auditory. So we had to throw away all that first data. Everybody saw or heard um, five stories which we called mentalizing stories. They were stories about a sales manager interacting with a customer. They listened to that. Each story was about 36 seconds long. Um, so they heard five of those stories, five different people. They heard five other stories which we called um, uh, process stories that didn't involve uh, mentalizing or inferring the feelings or thoughts of other people. And then they heard five other stories, which we called unlinked sentences, that were each sentence was a, a complete sentence, but it was nonsense. It wasn't linked to the other sentence. That's our, our control condition. The, the, um, the, other, the second one, group two, was a kind of control condition. So everybody heard 15 stories, 30-some um, seconds each, in the machine. While they were listening to these stories, they were... Um, we were scanning their brain to find out which parts of the brain were activated. Okay. So here I want to give you an example of each of those three kinds of stories so you get a flavor of what's going on. Um, so this is um, story two from the mentalizing condition. So before visiting a customer, Jacqueline always browses the customer's website. While browsing one of those websites, she notices that, notices that the director whom she has known for a long time, still works for the firm in question, but she also notices that many people have joined the firm. Jacqueline is especially curious about what these new people think of her firm. However, Jacqueline first decides to speak with the director, the person she has known a long time. Therefore, she calls him to suggest having dinner together. So they're listening to the 
while they're listening to it, we're finding out what's being activated in their mind. After they listen to the story, we ask a question or they hear a question. Um, why did Jacqueline ask the director to have dinner with her? That's part of the activation. So those are the mentalizing. That's an example of the mentalizing story. Here's an example of the process condition. Uh, in a seal company, the buyer's process occurs via a well-defined method. The buyers first study how previous firms supply goods and in collaboration with the technical stuff. Uh, this is a translation from the Dutch. Um, I don't know what their word was. They make up a request for a proposal. This, is, this RFP is then sent by email to salespersons from different firms who then indicate by email whether they can match the RFP subsequently using the economical arguments or financial arguments. The buyers determine which salesperson will deliver the goods. And then a second or two later, on what basis do buyers make decisions about which salesperson will deliver goods? And then they heard five stories with unlinked sentences. Here's an example. Uh, people are working hard on a new block and they expect it to be ready at the next uh, end of the next year. People are starting to ask when they will come with a new folder. One can ask if our vision about the future will catch on in the marketplace. The number of customers is rising according to a pattern. The housing market at this time is a bit unstable because the future of the tax deduction for rent is unclear. Around the Christmas season, the days are always short. <laughs> so that's a control condition. We want to activate people's thoughts. We want them to be here and to be thinking about what they're thinking about. But we want that to be compared to the condition where they actually make inferences about what the customer might be thinking or feeling. Okay. So here are the results. Um, this way presented with a cross section of the brain. Um, similar at the top, the, the colored bright part shows that the medial prefrontal cortex was indeed activated stronger for those sales managers in the interpersonal mentalizing condition, as were the left and right temporal parietal junction. Those were also activated more strong for the people mentalizing versus the control conditions. Then I mentioned that they all filled out the questionnaire, our questionnaire on the theory of mind, and the correlation uh, between their responses on that questionnaire and the intensity of the um, activation of the regions of the brain are shown here. For example, here's the score on the theory of mind scale. So the, the higher they scored on that scale, the more they were mentalizing, the more they were inferring the thoughts and feelings of other people, the higher was the activation of the right temporal parietal junction, medial prefrontal cortex, in the, in the left temporal parietal junction. Just as was found with children in the autism research. Now there was a third region I mentioned, the um, temporal poles. We found that there was no difference from that. And we went back and looked at the data and we saw that people in all conditions were activated strongly in the temporal poles. And with kind of hindsight, we conclude uh, that activation of temporal poles is um, connected to categorization. That when we categorize things, that gets activated. All of the sales managers had that activation. And one thing in this kind of selling situation, all of these um, account managers are trained to categorize their customers into different groups and to allocate their effort, time, and so on according to that categorization system. So I think that that's what that was showing, that that activation due to categorization um, didn't differentiate between conditions. Um, I mentioned after where we learned about the precuneus and we went back and analyzed the data and that third, I don't have a picture of it, but that third region was also activated for the people um, in this condition. Okay. Now, every study we do, every article we do, we always do a, a field study with real sales people and this was one of the ones that we did just to show the, the, the ellipses or the yeah, ellipses are the main variables and what we're trying to predict at the right was their actual performance. We actually had two different sales forces. So we want to see what's predicting their performance on the right. And we want to see if our sales theory of mind, remember the rapport building, detecting non-verbal cues at the left, taking a bird's eye view, irony, and shaping the interaction. We found that the rapport building 
the greater skill they had in rapport building as measured by our new scale, the less social anxiety they felt. Remember autism? People with autism feel a lot of social anxiety when they're interacting with others. Um, so the, the stronger that they were in, in theory of mind, the less anxiety they felt. The less anxiety they felt, the, um, the, the better they're coping with anxiety, the, the uh, greater their performance. Um, and then the other um, three dimensions of theory of mind actually had a direct effect on performance. The other two variables in this adaptiveness and perspective taking. Um, adaptiveness is a, a scale, famous scale in our literature developed by Bart Weitz um, that measures how well a person um, can stand on their feet, think on their feet, and adapt to the customer's needs on the fly, so to speak. Um, so it's interpersonal verbal kind of skills. Our claim was is that those skills would be based on our theory of mind but our theory of mind are more fundamental and would have an effect on performance, whereas this famous scale would not. And then it turns out it didn't. That's why there's no uh, asterisk on the number between adaptiveness and performance. So we, in the field, showed that this new scale, which was shown in the laboratory, so to speak, uh, although with real sales account managers, is working to influence the actual performance of the sales people. Um, <clears throat> these are different people given the machines. <coughs> okay. Um, I'm going to come back to those at the end because of time. Let me ask you a question. This is going to set up the next study. Um, do you have a colleague, boss, or employee who lies about his or her credentials and expertise, who values people only by what they can do for him or her, um, who successfully shifts blame for mistakes onto others, is so insensitive, cold, and unfeeling that it's scary? Um, gets the promotion and recognition others deserve, emerges unscathed from attempts to stop his or her quest for power, money, or promotion. If so, you may be dealing with a psychopath. <laughs> <laughs> now, not, um, not the bottom, but the first part there, I got off the back cover of this book, Snakes and Suits. Um, one of the authors, Robert Hare, is the world's leading researcher, psychiatrist, in psychopathy, or they, they call it psychopathy. Um, he's a professor at the University of British Columbia. Most of his research has been done with people in prisons, the hardened criminals, psychopaths, supposedly. And, um, so, and, but in terms of business, he says, I always said that if I wasn't studying psychopaths in prisons, I'd do so at the stock exchange. And um, this was a um, um, in an interview that I got out of New Yorker magazine that they had with him. And uh, he doesn't have a very flattering view of, of uh, business people. Um, and so I'm going to study them. And there's, there's something that we might call the dark side of empathy. Um, Simon Baron Cohn, Sasha Baron Cohn from those movies, is, I forget whether it's his brother or, or cousin, but they're related. Um, <laughs> Anyway, um, he's found that these three personality disorders, psychopathy, so-called borderline personality disorder, and narcissism, each of them share the property or characteristic that um, there's a deficit in empathy. All of them have that in common. He's, he's actually identified ten regions of the brain that are connected to these maladies. Um, so we want to study this with, with uh, managers. How can we do that? Well, we use the Machiavellian scale to do it, because Machiavellianism, is, as we'll see in a second, is similar to uh, psychopathy and involves an uh, empathy dis disorder. Uh, this is Niccolo Machiavelli, who was uh, born about 1469. He died in 27 or something like that in Florence, Italy. He lived at the same time as Leonardo da Vinci. They were contemporaries. And he was a diplomat, and he, he was asked on the behest, of, these were all city-states at the time, so Florence asked him to go a couple times to France with the King of France, the Habsburg King, the Pope, and many other intermediaries. He was doing, as a diplomat, many of the same functions, boundary spanning, crossing the border of his government and going into the government border of, a, of another party, it's often an adversary. 
he was asked to do things like that a salesperson might be asked to do in a sense when they leave their organization to go to the customer's organization. So that's what I want to study here um, and relate it maybe to self-interest. Same guy, um, De La Tour, same period. This is a period of time um, where many of the famous painters were doing moralistic, ethical um, themes. And so the previous one was the card shark. And this is one where um, this person here is getting his fortune told by the person on the right, our right, who's uh, called an Egyptian. And um, she's wearing uh, what at this time people thought that gypsies came from Egypt. And uh, hence the connection of the gypsies in Egypt at the melodical connection. And so she's the major fortune teller, and you can't see it, but on her garment at the bottom are two birds of prey. I don't know if they're falcons or hawks. And they're circling or ready to pounce on a rabbit because he's the rabbit. And he's paying her for his fortune. But while he's doing that, the person at our left, his right, is picking his pocket. The person in between him and the older person is actually, you can't see it, but she's cutting off his gold tassel. And I don't know what the other person's doing behind him, but they're all there to fleece him, to, to cheat him. Um, this is very indicative of a, of a Machiavellian kind of approach. Okay. But Machiavellianism is a personality, style, or trait characterized by social contact that, conduct that involves taking advantage of others for personal gain taking advantage of others for personal gain. It's contrasted with benevolent or cooperative action and plays a central role in politics, business, legal matters, as maybe everyday behavior. Um, some characteristics of Machiavellians, they have a dismal outlook on life and the nature of people. They're very cynical about other people. Um, they distrust people. They have a strategic orientation of opportunism. That's the way they'll talk about it. And if you, I should have put that in quotes because they'll often say, um, strike first or you'll get screwed or something like that is what I've heard. You know, strike first before the people take advantage of you. They use uh, tactics of deceit and guile and flattery and manipulation. And they're amoral, amoral, or maybe even immoral, because they tend not to feel guilt, shame, or embarrassment much, which are the so-called self-conscious emotions that are connected to when we do something bad, uh, when we hurt someone else, or when we do something that um, doesn't fit our self-image. They don't feel those kind of emotions, typically, the, the Machiavellian or the psychopath. Um, they exhibit what is often called by others a cool syndrome. When people watch them, they seem to be cool and collected. And, um, they're not distressed by other suffering, other people's suffering. So you can see why empathy isn't one of their characteristics, maybe. They're not committed to individuals, groups, or ideals, which from an organization point of view means they're not usually the best employee. Um, and also not the best employee for building long-term relationships. Maybe they'll do better than other people when there's a, a one-shot kind of selling situation. Uh, maybe a door-to-door -door salesperson that goes to a house and never comes back, and the customer doesn't have a chance to compare the product that he or she is selling to, to other products. Um, but that doesn't work well for most kind of business um, settings where you want long-term relationships. Okay, research to date is based on experimental or survey methods. Um, this is uh, we're, we're now under a third review at the Journal of Management. Um, and so I'm trying to relate it to the literature. And the, most of the literature has been done, um, majority in the psychology area, using experiments or surveys. And they use a particular scale, the Mach 4 scale. We use that as well. But everything is done with self-reports. We want to go further than that. We want to look inside the brains of, again, real managers and see, as a matter of degree, how Machiavellian they are and what are the consequences of that for themselves and the firm. So the, the research in the literature we found to be contradictory, and the explanations they give for this contradictory um, work is speculative. 
um, questions that are raised in literature from that our, our uh, interpretation of literature are are Machiavellians cooperative and trustworthy when it's to their advantage? Some people claim they are. Do Machiavellians use influence tactics that are both coercive and pro-social? Some researchers claim that they do. Uh, much of the research says that they only use the coercive. Is the success of Machiavellians due to their ability to read the minds of people with whom they interact? That's the theory of mind. Are Machiavellians good at experiencing the emotional states of others and do they use these to influence them? Um, so that's the affective part of empathy. Are they good at that? Are they better at that than the non-Machiavellians? That's the question we asked. Do Machiavellians take the perspective of others better than non-Machiavellians, as some people in the literature have claimed? So we use the same experimental design for this that I showed before the faces uh, with the salespeople um, to study mirror neurons. That's the empathy registration system in our minds, our brains. And uh, um, here's a summary of the research. I just want to say the regions of the brain are again are listed at the left, but the key number is the right-hand column, which is the correlation. This is the results. We had two studies because um, we had two sets of stimuli. Um, this is actually the stimuli for the um, theory of mind where they listen to those um, stories of um, um, mentalizing. And what we found was is that the, um, the greater the activation of all these regions here, the less uh, people's scores on theory of mind were. In essence, Machiavellians, people who score high in Machiavellianism, are less able to take the perspective of others. They're less able to put themselves in the shoes of other people than non-Machiavellians. So this speculative thing in research uh, that they're good at doing that doesn't seem to hold. On the other hand, for the emotional part, and again at the left are the regions of the brain that are associated with emotions, especially in mirror neurons. There, except for the precuneus, which is the, the part of theory of mind, which is our, our manipulation check here, um, there's a positive relationship. And what this means is, is that people who score high in Machiavellianism are able, more than non-Machiavellians, to resonate to the feelings of other persons, in this case in an automatic way. That if, if a person sitting across from them in, say, a sell, selling situation, um, is resisting or has a negative reaction to their product or service, they're able to pick that up better than a non-Machiavellian, although they're not aware of it because this occurs automatically. So we say that their automatic resonance, the Machiavellian's automatic resonance is better or stronger um, than a non-Machiavellian. So we find kind of this uh, opposite kind of pattern here. In the psychology literature, classic psychology literature to, to today, that the defining characteristics of empathy are that you are able to take the perspective of others and you feel compassion for others. But we're finding that that's not true for Machiavellians. They're even better able to take, um, they're worse able to take the perspective of others, but they're better able to feel uh, the negative emotions or the pain of the others, although in a non-thinking way automatic way. I stress that non-thinking automatic way because there is a kind of empathy where we're really aware of it. But in this case, we're measuring their things that they're not aware of. It's below the level of consciousness. Okay. And then um, this is just the correlations of the scores that they have on a Machiavellian scale with the intensity of what goes on in their brain. So here we're having, we're relating what's called a cross-level analysis. Uh, we're taking psychological variables, self-report. We're relating it to activation in the brain. That's one way of bridging things that brings this into a um, more managerial level. And then we, the next thing we did was our field study. So we said that let's look at real salespeople now, a hundred and some of them, and let's look at the conditions where Machiavellianism may work well and not well. What are those conditions? Well, one of the conditions is supervisory control, manager control, you know, giving feedback, monitoring the person that's subordinate under you, um, encouraging them, giving them all, having this kind of influence. 
we hypothesize, and this is what this shows here, the, the solid line going from bottom left to upper right, that's the low Machiavellianism. We hypothesize that those people who score better on theory of mind are able to interact in a rapport building kind of way. We, we hypothesize that people low in Machiavellianism should actually perform better um, so under high supervisory control because they're interacting with the manager and are able to uh, benefit from that in a way um, that the high Machiavellian person is not. So under high supervisory, uh, Machiavellian person, when control is strong, they can't get away with their manipulation and their deception. Uh, but the low Machiavellians benefits from the managerial support and their performance is greater. Then we looked at, uh, this, this is performance, it's called in-roll performance. It's part of the job description. They're expected to, to perform in a certain way in terms of selling, you know, how much they sell and what they sell. Then we looked at what's called um, other role performance or non-role performance, uh, organization citizenship behaviors, sometimes called altruistic behaviors in the organization. That's when you, you do things for the benefit of the organization and also the benefit of the people you work with. It's not part of your job description. It's not expected of you, but you do it. Uh, or, or to a certain degree or not. Um, how does Machiavellians um, uh, relate to that? So we looked at organization citizenship behaviors individual. That's our dependent variable on the um, up and down y-axis. And we said, well, in, in terms, these are things like mentoring people that you're not required to mentor, helping someone, a coworker that might be sick and saying, well, I'll, I'll take over for you. Why don't you go home? These things are not as visible as the next kind that I'll talk about. For those kinds of organization citizenship behaviors, the, again, the low Machiavellian is a, um, the, the higher, the, um, under supervisory control, the low Machiavellian actually does more of those organization citizenship behaviors than those without uh, low control. Low Machiavellian. The high Machiavellian, there's not much of a relationship there at all because it's not visible. If, if the manager isn't going to see it, why do it is their attitude because they're always looking out having an extra, extrinsic kind of reward orientation, more or less. Then we did the organization citizenship behavior. Others, uh, these are things like attending committee meetings, um, you know, doing things for the good of the organization that maybe isn't required but helps the organization and are very observable to supervisors. And there we predicted that the under um, high supervisory control, the person high in Machiavellianism will do more of those things. Because they're visible, it's going to make them look better. And indeed, that's what we found in the, in the field. Okay. Um, I'm going to do a quick summary of uh, consumer reactions now. Everything I've been talking about has been at the level of the account manager. We've been studying, um, there, we have four studies, two of them are coming out, forthcoming, and two are under review. And we've been um, looking at when corporations do good things, how, why do consumers react the way they do? And when they, corporations do you know, malfeasance, bad things, how do um, consumers respond. And the, there's a lot of research that shows that, that responsible corporate behavior leads to positive attitudes towards the company, uh, leads to positive word of mouth, and irresponsible corporate behavior leads to negative word of mouth and, and negative attitudes and negative word of mouth towards companies. So there's a lot of research showing this, that in essence, you know, you act responsible or irresponsible, consumers respond this way. But we want to know why, how and why. You know, what are the things that govern this response um, that transform what the corporation does um, into positive or negative actions? So in the first study, um, we looked at um, positive things corporations do, and we looked at the emotion of gratitude that kind of re helps to regulate this process. And under conditions we call altruistic values, or, you know, these, these are called, these are actually civic virtues that a person holds. They're values that um, 
we garnered from um, work done by Sloan Schwartz and his colleagues. And uh, so there are other focus values and self-focus values that we use as disguises. So those, those kind of feelings of um, caring and beneficence and other things like that towards people, that's the altruistic values, um, interact with the felt gratitude. And gratitude is the motivator here to influence people's behaviors. So we had a, this was our model. We did an experiment in the field with real consumers, adult consumers, and we um, manipulated positive corporate social responsibility at the left. Um, quickly, uh, one of the settings that we've been looking at is a confectionery company, a European confectionery company. It's a fictitious name, but it's a, a real situation. And this company um, uses conscripts children to work on its um, cocoa plantations in uh, Sierra Leone area of Africa. And um, uh, so, I mean, you know, steals them, abuses them, um, uh, beats them, and it, it does everything bad you can think of. Um, on the other hand, that's the next study. I, I took things in a different order here. On the other hand, we manipulated... Uh, um, the condition where the company is very socially responsible to those children. Actually doesn't use children, it uses only adults and provides education and other things for the families and children of those workers. Um, the felt gratitude that they feel when the corporation does that, we want to look at the effects of that on positive word of mouth communication with regard to the company and various advocacy behaviors that they do to uh, support the company. Uh, and, um, as opposed to in the negative case where we talk about protest behaviors. Now, so there's a pathway from the actual committing of these positive corporate acts through feelings of gratitude to positive word of mouth and advocacy. But they only occur to the degree that the consumer holds these altruistic values. So that's why the altruistic values, consumer moral values are shown um, with an arrow going to the center of the line there. That implies a statistical interaction, which, which means that there's a so-called moderation effect. Their feelings of gratitude, the influence of their feelings of gratitude occur to the extent that they hold these moral values. You have to have both. So it's sort of like a mixture of both of them. Each one working alone doesn't work. It's the combination of the two. And then to control things, because previous research, hasn't, which hasn't looked at gratitude, has looked at evaluating the company favorably and identifying with the company. How, how strongly do you identify with companies that do these positive things? We measured those and wanted to control for them because they're rival hypotheses. And then we also controlled for age, gender, and egoistic motives for the corporate social responsibility. Uh, some people take a, a cynical viewpoint when companies seem to be doing positive things. They say that people say that the company is only doing that because they want to look good and make a profit only. And so we measured that. We want to control that kind of reaction. And so we controlled for that. So um, we have all of those other variables in there. We want to say, see whether feelings of gratitude over and above um, um, positive evaluations of the company and identification with them influence their positive word of mouth and positive behaviors as governed by their moral values. And that's what we found. I'm going to skip over the measurements of that and quickly go to the next study. Um, the next study was looking at corporate irresponsible behavior. And um, we want to ask the, answer the question, why and how do consumers respond to corporate irresponsibility and what actions do they take to punish influence corporations that cause harm. That's the main outcome, but we want to look at the uh, motivation for that, which are again are um, uh, what are called moral emotions as governed by the moral values. So we demonstrate how consumers' negative moral emotions, in this case the contempt and disgust, is there, um, um, very contemporary emotions that psychologists are studying with regard to moral behavior. We measured those people's reaction to those uh, emotions. And their moral virtues uh, related to the community, social justice, and welfare of others. 
the combination of those we looked at to see how it influenced negative word of mouth and protests um, directed against the corporation. We looked at um, in our experiments, uh, these are field experiments with adult consumers that we intercept while they're shopping in the city. Um, we have two different settings. The one is called, and we're using the language from anthropology and, and um, psychology, one is called the ethical transgression. And here we have this company, Dark Chocolate. Um, people are exposed to a long scenario, page long scenario, but this is a synopsis of it. Um, and the, where children were conscripted. That's the ethical transgression. And then we did a, another experiment with social transgressions where a large store, um, Walmart-like store, comes into a community and um, basically um, this was done in Italy. So the, the stores in Italy were uh, small shopkeepers who for many generations operated there. Here comes this big Walmart in there, puts them out of business, um, and actually takes over a, a beloved um, a community center uh, in the Comune. And um, so that, that's the social transgression. There's research showing that and under ethical transgressions of the kind that's there where people's freedom are violated, their human dignity is violated, that the main emotional response in us when we hear about that is righteous anger. And usually we get angry when our own personal goals are blocked. Somebody blocks our goal, we get angry at them. But it can happen that where somebody else's dignity is violated, we can get angry at the person who commits that even though it's not our own. That's called righteous anger. And then in the, um, the social transgression, the, um, the emotional reaction there is one of contempt, which is often a combination of disgust and anger. And then we had a control condition where uh, people didn't have that uh, ethical and social transgression um, made. So I'm just going to show the diagram and, I'll, and then we'll wrap up. Um, we manipulate the transgression and we have a control condition. That's the X in the lower left. We measure people's contempt, anger, and disgust. We measure their moral values. And we measure as dependent variables on the right, the Y, uh, their actual negative word of mouth and protest actions that they would take. And we want to see what are the paths, uh, pathways that this influence occurs and do the interactions occur according to the predictions. And, and they did. Um, I, I'm not going to talk about the last two studies, but the one of the uh, studies um, deals with uh, offshoring and when companies offshore, we, we actually created conditions where they offshore the design or the manufacturer or both or neither of the two and we look at people's feelings of gratitude, anger, contempt and disgust along with their moral values to see if that influences consumer reactions to offshoring and, and it did. I went over a few minutes, and I'm sorry, but that's, that's all I'm going to do in terms of the formal presentation. Yeah, thank you. I just want to say a quick thank you to uh, Professor Rick Bogosi for coming and speaking with us today. If the theme of this semester's Positive Link sessions is uh, on positive business and the intersection between uh, doing what's right for the bottom line and what's right for the people in the organization and what's right for society at large, then clearly the things you've shared with us today show that empathy is a big part of cracking that puzzle. And so I want to thank you for, for sharing that. Thank you also to Janet and Janelle for organizing the pizza and the session. Uh, and uh, finally, the next session in this series will be on November 12th, which will be on positive law. Uh, how can the function of law uh, and compliance in a business be organized such that it can maximize value for all stakeholders? So I look forward to seeing you there. Thanks for coming.